Hi, thank you for coming to the marsh tonight. And by the marsh, I mean my living room and the homes of the performers you're going to see here tonight. Um, we will have three performers tonight. Uh, at one point, there were going to be four, but uh, there were one person had uh, medical issues. So um, we are showing you new work. Mm -hmm. uh, all this work that you see tonight uh, is new and has been um, coming out of the imaginations of the performers mm -hmm. over the last three months or so. And uh, okay. I count that as a little bit of a miracle. So with that in mind, let me, uh, without further ado, introduce our first performer of the night. Here is Ginger Parnes. My mother was the most beautiful woman on earth. Now, I'm sure a lot of other people think that about their mothers. What my mother had beyond her movie star good looks was a spirited and zest for life that many people didn't have. She poured herself with joy into everything she did. She painted, she taught first grade Sunday school, and she sewed. My mother was always smiling and laughing, and she could laugh at herself. My mother, she glowed. <laughs> Good morning, Mary Sunshine. It's June 30th. Mommy, today I'm seven years old. Yes, you are, princess, and we're going to go downtown. I want you to put on your very favorite outfit and get ready for us to have an adventure. Mommy, Let's wear the matching dresses you made us. Good idea. And don't forget the gloves that your grandma sent you. Today, we're gonna be fine ladies. <laughs> it's the mid 1950s in Miami, Florida. What my mother has planned is for us to take the bus downtown to go to Burdine's department store and go to the tea room. And I'm gonna get to have a yummy snow princess. <laughs> What's also special about today is my brothers aren't coming. Usually when we go downtown, my mother brings my brothers. Now, Edmund and Larry are seven and 10 years older than I. So it's like having two extra parents. They <laughs> boss me around. They teach me things. They tease me. They think I'm their own personal doll. <laughs> mother told me there was a time when we were living in Pittsburgh where one of the neighbors came to the house. Well, hello, Mrs. Tapper. Oh, uh, Miss Palms, Jeans might not know this, but your boys, you're taking your daughter's carriage to the top of Lilac Hill and they're letting the carriage show and they're going to go down to the hill and chase it. <gasps> oh my. Another thing when we used to go downtown is they would put a pink leash on me and <laughs> they would make sure I wouldn't get lost. But my brothers would tug me here and tug me there. They were always laughing and having fun with me. Now, as my mother puts on her hat on her lustrous auburn hair, she says, Ginger? I want you to show me how they taught you how to model gloves in your modeling class. Like this, mommy. <laughs> you are so precious. Let's go take the bus. It's on the corner and we're going to go downtown. Now, it's June 30th. Summer in Miami, Florida. Yeah. The temperature is 90 degrees and the humidity is also 90 degrees. We are perspiring as we get on the bus, glad to be out of the sun, and we flop ourselves down near the front door so the breeze will hit us as the bus heads downtown. There are a few people sitting next to us, and there are several Black people sitting in the back of the bus. That's the way it was then. This was before Rosa Parks made her bold choice to keep her seat in the front of the bus. Now, 
Miami might be filling up with snowbirds and New Yorkers, but mark my words, there's no doubt about it. Miami was a Southern town. In fact, many people pronounced it Miami. We finally get to the Burdines and we walk in. Oh, I feel the air conditioning. Oh, mommy, when are we gonna get an air conditioner? Well, your daddy says, as soon as he makes his next deal, we're going to get an air conditioner. Look at this department store. It's usually decorated so nicely, but now they've got all these big red and white flowers in huge blue vases. Maybe that's for July 4th. You are so smart. Okay, honey, let's go. See that lady over there? Oh, she's got a hat on and she got her gloves and her pocketbook for her purse. She's carrying a Burdines department store bag. Let's us get a bag too. I'd like to buy a gift for one of my sisters. My mother grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. There were two brothers and five sisters and they were very close. The story goes that when my father met my mother and all of her sisters, he immediately fell in love with Sarah, the prettiest and the sweetest of them all. After they got married, he would be so proud to have her on his arm. Sarah, you're looking gorgeous tonight. Let's get Aunt Fran a silk scarf, maybe two. You know, Ginger, I wish dad hadn't moved us sometimes down to Miami from Pittsburgh, I miss my family. Oh, but mommy, I love living in Miami. I get to walk around barefoot in the grass all the time. And, 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 and Miss Miller thought I was so clever to take my gardenias and put it in my inkwell and watch all the petals turn blue. And we get to go to the beach and have picnics at Key Biscayne. Yes, dear, but I still miss my family. Oh, mommy, we go up there every summer and you go in the winter too. Enough of that, enough of that. Let's go find the millinery department because right next door will be the scarf department. And as we take the escalator up, it's like a wonderland. There are mannequins with sparkling long dresses and the jewelry cases are shining. Ginger, how many times have I told you not to play on the escalator? Three. We get off and go into the department. My mother immediately finds the scarves and starts going through them. Well, Aunt Fran really likes yellow. Let's find her a yellow scarf. Yeah. Now, what color do you think you would put with this? Green. Green is good, but how about this? And she reaches to the bottom of the pile and pulls out the most gorgeous purple scarf and lays it next to the yellow. I'm dazzled by the combination. Purple is going to be my new favorite color. Okay, now let's get to that tea room and have our party. We walk into the tea room and it's magical. There's piano music playing and there's men in tuxedos gliding around helping their patrons. They take us to a table filled with white crisp linens shining silverware and sparkling glasses. The waiter pulls out two big cushioned chairs and sits us down. He pours water and then takes our order. It's my birthday. I'd like a snow princess, please. Now, Ginger, take off your gloves and put them on your lap and then put the napkin on top of your gloves. Like this, mommy. Oh, you're so the napkin's bigger than you. And then the snow princess comes. Now, a snow princess is a meringue circle 
ripply meringue circle with a big scoop of white ice cream on the top. It's got all those little silver dots all around it to make the princess look sparkly. And on the top is a little snow princess plastic blonde. And I get to take it home after we go. Oh, mommy, this is the best day ever. I'm glad my brothers aren't here. And look, mommy, I feel so grown up. My feet almost touch the ground. I'm glad to have this time away from our hot and loud house. My brother Larry's probably asking for a baseball glove. My brother Eddie is probably fighting with my father about what time to bring the car home. I mean, there's a lot of teasing and bantering going around in our house, but it's chaotic. Now, when my parents go out to the symphony, my brothers babysit me. I idolize my brothers. One time I walk into the kitchen. You guys are smoking cigarettes. Don't tell mommy. I won't tell if you let me have a puff. You're too young. Just one puff. Okay, now suck in like a straw. <laughs> I never became a cigarette smoker. Now my brother teach me all kinds of games, war and jacks. And I particularly like it when my brother Larry takes me across the street to the junior high school on the weekends. We roller skate all down the halls. One time, my mother comes with us. Oh, Larry, I haven't ice skated since I was a little girl. The neighborhood we live in has about 10 or 12 houses and all the kids play in the street. We play dodgeball and we play all kinds of games and it's friendly, but a little competitive. I'm a little tired of about hearing how about everybody else is getting air conditioners in the window. We don't have an air conditioner yet, but we do have a TV. Only thing is now we have to whisper at dinner time so dad can watch the news that damn joe mccarthy and his communist blacklist i'm so glad that lawyer said to him sir do you have no decency well dave tonight we're not going to be watching the news because ed sullivan's on and guess who's going to be on elvis presley Daddy, I love it when he goes, you ain't nothing but a hound dog. And I pull up my little rocking chair and I put it right in front of the TV. And like thousands of girls and teens and women all over the country, I scream and yell as Elvis gyrates and croons, not knowing that my family is behind me laughing at me. Elvis sings and I scream. <laughs> Then came a time when there was a lot of hushed conversation going on in the house. I hear doctors, Pittsburgh, operation. Mommy, please don't go. I have to go, honey. I'm going to have an operation. But you'll be here with Daddy and Eddie and Larry. Don't leave me with them. And you'll have sweet, kind Bessie also. I'm going to come back, honey, because I have you to come back to. My mom was gone for weeks, months, <laughs> forever, it seemed. While she was gone, I got the measles. Come here, Ginger. Let me put that calamine lotion on you. Oh, Daddy, you're too messy. You let Bessie do it. I'm here, darling. I'm here. I'll help you tomorrow. When's my mommy coming home? Soon, dear. Soon. Soon never seemed to come. And when Bessie went home at night, I'd stand by the window 
and watch her go to the street corner under that old light. Bessie, don't go. Eddie, Eddie, mommy's coming home today. Oh, I'm really glad she's coming home. It's hard being the oldest kid and you with the measles. But look, all my scabs and scars are gone. I'm gonna show mommy. Look, there's mommy's car. There's daddy's car. And mommy, he's helping mommy out of the car. Where's my mommy? My mother's head was completely shaved and she had a huge scar going down her side of her face. She had these fake bangs on with a scarf and she talked kind of funny. She was a little bit scary to me. And then I hear, Mary Frances, sounds like mommy. And when she takes me in her arms, feels like mommy, Shalimar, it is my mommy. My mother is home. Eddie, Eddie, mommy talks like Elvis. Love me tender, ginger. Don't say that anymore. Mommy had an operation and the doctors made a big mistake. She can't hear out of that side of her face and, and, and her face is gonna be frozen on one side forever, it seems. But she's still our mommy and she loves us so and she loves you particularly. And my mother goes on with life, with her spirit and joy. My whole life, I benefited by her grace and resilience during this time. We never spoke of it. It was amazing how she just poured herself back into our life, taking care of us. And even when people would come up to her and say, what's wrong with your face? She would gracefully answer, I do look a little funny, don't I? I could never have been that cool about it as she was. But was she? All the time? I recall being in the living room and my mother's all dressed up to go out with my father. I'm not going anywhere with you, tin ear, crooked mouth. I'm tired of looking at your ugly face. Daddy, Daddy, stop playing mommy. She, she looks so pretty. Stop making my mommy cry. Years later, when I was visiting my parents as an adult, I made some comment about committing suicide. My mother follows me out of the room. Ginger, are you telling me that you would consider committing suicide? Mom, people talk about it. You know, I'm not the only, I mean, I'm not going to, but people do talk about it. Haven't you ever thought of it? Not me. There would be too much I would miss. Woo. All right. Wow. Wow. Well done. Bravo, Ginger. So oh, bravo. Woo. Yeah. Oh my God. That's really beautiful, Ginger. Yeah. Uh, really touching, honey. Nice. Man. Beautiful, beautiful. Ginger. I love the Ginger. Johnny, 
wake up. Bunky, I think I need to go to the hospital. I'm worried I might hurt myself. I'm startled out of my half sleep state, trying to parse if this is a dream or a reality. He's not really suicidal. This is some bullshit manipulation tactic. Considering how insane things have been as of late, I wouldn't put it past him. We've gotten so fucking toxic. This seems like a reasonable next step in the shitstorm of a relationship. What? What? Are you sure? You really think you need to go to the ER? Then my training as a psychiatric nurse practitioner comes into play. What has he taken? Does he mean it? He's never told me he's felt suicidal before. If your partner tells you to take them to the ER, you just do it. All right, I'll get dressed. It turns out that in the hour since I went to sleep, Troy has continued to drink and presumably taken more benzos, probably Adderall too. Who the fuck knows at this point? My initial surprise, anger, and fear have all quieted down as my problem solver survival mode kicks in. My fixer, this is what I was born for. I knew that Troy was gonna be a project, a fine wine that needed to be aged to perfection. So here we go, fix it, John. If you can fix Troy, then perhaps you can fix yourself. <laughs> or at least fix your emotionally unavailable bio dad. Or maybe even Eric, compared to those, uh, fixing Troy should be a cinch. Where does my fixer mode come from? The earliest example I can think of is with Eric at Disney World when I was 12. Whoa, that was such a blast. I've never experienced anything like it. It went so fast and it was so dark in there. It really felt like we were in space. We really were in a mountain in space. Eric staggers and runs straight into a pole. <gasps> Eric, holy crap, are you okay? Oh, yeah, yes, yeah, sport. Oh, I just got a little lightheaded. I, I must be dizzy after that coaster. I probably just need something to eat. So why don't we just go over here and, and grab a bite? We stop to eat at a little outdoor cafe in Tomorrowland, the lunching pad. After some water, sweet tea, and burgers, Eric seems back to his normal self. So we move on to continue our day of adventure in the happiest place on earth. The first image that comes to mind when Eric's name is invoked is lunch. <laughs> Sitting in our regular booth at our favorite haunt during our sacred weekly dates, age six to 10, a few years prior to that bizarre day at Disney. Why is it that something so seemingly mundane as eating is one of my clearest and most evocative memories of this man? I think it's the ritual. It's the ritual of it that's so seared into my brain. How endearing probably because I never had such rituals with my grandfather or my bio dad. Now that I think about it, I guess I've never had such a ritual since. I was the one to abandon our rituals, right? When I moved to California, but I was only 10 and I didn't choose to move. I didn't even wanna move. No 10 year old wants to leave their home, their friends, their Eric, Eric lunch, the marketplace grill. Without fail, Eric would order one tostada Florentine then some flaming queso or spinach artichoke dip. Damn, this place be fancy by Arkansas standards. The tostada Florentine was a fried tortilla crust with gobs of melted cheese, cream spinach, pico de gallo, and jalapenos on top. Pretty much the same thing as the queso and the spinach artichoke dip. Combined, just presented in a slightly fancier way. A crispy, buttery, cheesy tortilla chip pie. We Arkansans sure do know how to do comfort food. Oh, and two loaded baked potatoes on the side. Stuffed full of more melted cheese, bacon bits, gobs of sour cream, and most importantly, we can't forget the sweet tea. So much fucking sweet tea. 
whenever I would go to Eric's house, he would serve up the most saccharine, yet divine, sweet tea made with an inordinate amount of pure, full calorie white sugar. Eric taught me his recipe when I moved to California so that I could continue the tradition on my own. God, I loved our rituals together. Just like the tea, it was all so, so sweet. And so incredibly beautiful to be that loved by that man. I need your name, date of birth, and an insurance card. Troy is silent. I said name, date of birth, and insurance card. My Capricorn moon comes out in full force in times of crisis. I go into a flow state. Intuition takes over and I just make things work. I solve problems. I survive. I often forget how much of a natural I am in these situations. A natural, natural disaster, a natural borderline whisperer. I brief the triage nurse and then we sit around to wait. Wow, <laughs> this is all so fascinating. What are you talking about, Troy? What's fascinating? I look around, assuming he spotted a decapitated person that just came in. You know, just all the stuff that goes on in a hospital. It's really cool. Is this kid fucking kidding me right now? You woke me up to take you to the ER because you were worried you'd kill yourself, and now you're captivated and intrigued by the inner workings of our shitty medical system? Are you having fun, Troy? This isn't supposed to be fun. I'm certainly not having fun. Eric came into my life when I was six years old and completely transformed it for the better. Eric was my big brother from the Big Brothers Big Sisters nonprofit. Basically, he volunteered to take in a young lad who needed a quality male role model. That's me. Eric was a polite, handsome Southerner, 24 years my elder, who was in law school, dating a nice young lady from church and an all around great guy. At that point, my primary male role models were my absent bio dad and my toxically masculine grandfather, Slim Pickens. Eric was a breath of fresh air. Within a year of hanging out together, I started spending at least one night a week at Eric's house. We'd go on all sorts of fun outings, like theme parks, movies, hikes, and on and on. <laughs> oh, and Eric bought me all the toys and video games I could ever have wanted. What more could a boy ask for? I realize that this all sounds like superficial shit. No, I didn't need another fucking Beanie Baby ad in my collection. And Lord knows I didn't need any more video games. My screen time was already alarmingly high, but it sure felt nice. Mostly, it was incredible to be loved and appreciated by a functional adult male. Eric was the first man to make me feel special, to make me feel loved, to make me feel lovable. Everyone assumed that Eric was my dad and people would often comment as such when we were out and about. We generally corrected them, but I secretly relished in being considered his son. Eric really did become an integral part of my family. We occasionally visited his brother in Florida, which was always a good time because it meant that we got to go to the beach as well as to Disney World. He joined my family on our ski trips to Estes Park, Colorado, and eventually on diving trips to Hawaii after I had moved to California and learned to scuba dive from my stepdad, Lee. It was around that time after I moved to California that things with Eric started getting strange. I moved from Little Rock to San Jose when I was 10, when my mom got remarried. But I continued to talk to Eric on the phone every Sunday morning. It was our sacred time and I never missed a call. When I was 12, Eric got in an accident and rolled his car. I don't know all the details, but I knew that he was injured and was being treated with meds. Zippity doo da, zippity day. My oh my, what a wonderful day. Holy crap, I'm soaking wet, but it was totally worth it. How 
freaking cool with those singing bears. Woo, yeah, that one's always a hoot. Hey, say it, sport. You ready for dinner? Let's go grab a bite. Eric, what? We just ate before going on Splash Mountain. Oh, right, yeah, I'm just joshing with you. Back at the hotel. Eric, we need to call my mom and talk to her about what happened. Something isn't right. No, nah, sport, everything's fine. I just got a little dizzy for a bit. That's all. It was probably, I was dehydrated. Hey, why don't we go to the arcade and play some games? Eric, you ran into a pole. And then you forgot that we had dinner an hour before we ate. Things are not okay. All right, sport. Yeah, you're right. I was just a bit out of it, but I'm feeling lots better now. I think it's just these meds that I've got to take, you know, since I tweaked my, my neck in the accident. Well, whatever it is, I want to call my mom. All right, all right, JR, sure. We can give her a call. I call my mom and tell her what happened and she can clearly hear I'm concerned. They end up talking for 15 minutes as I listen on. They do talk about the medications. He even reads her the bottles. Everything seems to be okay and our trip continues in the happiest place on earth. The weirdness culminated a few, de a few days later on the Disney Cruise Line. Holy crap, Eric. I just read that they have this really cool preteen area on the ship. No adults allowed. With an arcade, big screen TVs, computer games, and a really, really cool looking lounge with beanbag chairs. No adults allowed? What, are you trying to ditch me? What? No. You didn't even want to hold my hand when we were at Disney. Do you not want to be seen with me anymore? Eric, I'm 12. It's embarrassing. I didn't see any other 12 year olds holding hands with their big brothers or their dads. This behavior was extraordinarily out of character. I can't recall another time in the seven years of knowing Eric that he yelled at me. Unsurprisingly, after that vacation, I was extremely weirded out. When I got back to California, I started dodging his calls. Wow, Bunky, I didn't realize you had that much to drink. The doctors eventually come back with a report telling us that Troy's BAC is dangerously high. They can't do a proper suicide assessment while he's this intoxicated, so he's got to dry out in the ER and they'll reevaluate in a few hours. Wow, Bunky, I didn't realize you had that much to drink. Yes, you heard me right. I said Bunky, B-U-N-K-Y, Bunky Bear to be precise. I have no idea where that word came from, a saccharine sweet bastardization of buddy or bunny or goddess knows what. Regardless, it's been our pet name for one another since we lived together in mostly harmonious bliss in Eugene, Oregon two years prior. That was genuinely one of the most beautiful, sweetest times of my life. We were so incredibly happy. The most notable memory that springs to mind is a brilliant late spring Saturday afternoon, taking LSD, cuddling in our hammock on the back deck, marinating in the life-giving warmth of the magnificent, magnificent sun as the Grateful Dead blast through the open French doors, showering us with a psychedelic wonderment of one of the best scarlet fires they ever performed. Watching the giant oak sway and morph into vibrant kaleidoscope purples and greens, after having our minds blown by the dead, we decided to bike the few miles across town to Alton Baker Park. To this day, still one of my favorite parks on earth. Speeding down the meadow trails, wind blowing through our hair, following the river upstream till we find a secluded, seemingly secret grove overlooking the stream. We've yet to actually swim in these chilly waters since we moved here last September, so why not now? Fuck it! We're young in love and tripping balls in one of the great hippie bastions of the good old US of A. So it's skinny dipping time. We scurry down the small little cliffside and jump into the crystal clear burbling brook. Holy shit! I said chili before? This stream is as frigid as an ice queen's tit. Invigorating, that's for sure. 
glorious, glorious memories. Young, dumb, and very much in love. Bunky and Bunky. Bunky, what all did you take? I have no idea what exactly he consumed, but I know it was a lovely cocktail of drugs and alcohol. For sure wine and benzos, probably Adderall too. Troy's been handing out pills to our friends like it's candy. <laughs> of course, when I gave him the ultimatum to go to therapy or we wouldn't move in together, I didn't expect that he'd end up seeing a psychiatrist, a glorified drug dealer. <laughs> That's rich coming for me, a glorified drug dealer. <laughs> As a psych MP, you think I'd have a better radar for crazies, but this is where attachment trauma comes into play. All right, I do have radar for crazies. It's just better known as attraction. I've been aware since the age of 20 that I'm drawn to emotionally unavailable men, boys rather, and they almost always tend to be addicts. It doesn't take being a therapist to know that this is one of the many symptoms of my obvious daddy issues. A fag with daddy issues? Groundbreaking. What a fucking cliche. But my bio dad is gay himself. And he left my mom for a man. Only after my mom pushed him into coming out because of his increasingly peculiar behavior. But bio fag nonetheless. Doc, I need an HIV test. My mom's physician shoots her a shocked and incredulous glare. I need to know. Do I have it? Do my kids? It was 1989 and my mom, the nurse, was very attuned to the going on of the epidemic. Learning that her husband had been taking loads from strangers in the park immediately sparked fear into her heart. Now, as a man in my thirties, I'm very aware that my romantic attachment style is anxious avoidant. In my youth, I had no idea what to call it, what to make of it, or how to work with it. So it just left me perpetually pursuing emotionally unavailable boys. Someday, I'll finally start that nonprofit for wayward twinks, the Broken Twink Project. We'll even have an inpatient psych hospital for all those truly crazy twinks, like the love of my life, Troy Matthew Friedman. You've heard of Lincoln, but what about Twinkin Memorial Hospital? It'll be a while for the Xanax and booze to wear off. And I have a 10 hour shift in just a few hours. So Troy and I agree that I should leave. I head home, pop a Xanax, how poetic, and pass the fuck out. I wake up to a slew of missed texts. Johnny, I can't believe you fucking took me to the ER. This place is horrific. I've been in a room for three hours with a bunch of insane people who seem like they're dying, psychotic, or worse. Never, ever do this to me again. I look at my phone and wonder. Confusion, fury, but the show must go on and I sure as hell ain't losing my new dream job over this bullshit. So I get dressed and head to work. When I get home at 9 p.m., Troy is sitting in the kitchen, having cocktails and making dinner. So what's going on, Bunky? How did it all turn out? I see that they didn't commit you. Seriously, Johnny, that was a fucking nightmare. One of the most traumatic, horrific experiences of my life. I can't believe you just left me there. What do you mean, Troy? You told me to take you, Johnny. That's because you were bossing me around to clean the apartment. I wasn't actually suicidal. I was only trying to teach you a lesson. Johnny, wake up, Johnny. I'm startled out of my half sleep state, trying to parse whether this is a dream or reality, hazy floating, disoriented, mom sitting on the bed, gently shaking me towards consciousness. I open my eyes and my stepdad towers over, 
supportively standing aside, looking on towards me, misty, concerned gaze, confusion, nervous. We have some terrible news we need to tell you. My throat tightens, panic, terror, John. Eric passed away last night. Bomb drop. Gut punch. Disbelief. Denial. What, what do you mean? How? He died of an overdose. Heart sinks. Grief, despair, flashes of emotion, rage. Eric, why the fuck would you leave me? We're not sure if it was an accident or intentional chest tightens dread guilt if only i hadn't been dodging his calls since disney world this is my fault i should have helped him i could have saved him how the fuck am i going to be able to trust anyone ever again Thank you. In our last class, I discussed doing a rather extensive inventory of the person you're dating for alcohol addiction, issues with pot, and grammar. As I was saying, for obvious reasons, your potential partner must be willing to go to couples counseling and perhaps Recovering Couples Anonymous, RCA. RCA is a lot less expensive, and believe me, as I said, you cannot pay for theater like that. I thought I'd just mention that when I married my husband, he was a cub pack leader who had 64 little cub scouts with little arrows of light. He wore a gorgeous red Pendleton jacket covered with badges. Within the first six months of marriage, he went out and bought a Harley. And now he looks just like a biker. Not exactly what I was visualizing. And part of the package was my mother-in-law whose favorite thing to do on Mother's Day was to ride on the back of the Harley, fully decked out in leather, in which she looked a whole lot younger than I did. She looked a lot like a young Stevie Nicks with her long blonde hair streaming in the wind and her long legs wrapped around my husband for hours. She looked better than Stevie Nicks, while I followed behind in the car so we could all have lunch. On the question, should I be with someone I am really not attracted to? We are not going to cover that. We are also not going to cover honesty, affairs, or age-appropriate housing, among other things, but it may not matter. I'll just say this, you are going to follow these directions, then you're going to ignore all of this. Scientific research shows you are going to disregard all of this. You have decided that the person you are having coffee and soup with is perfect for you. Based on what? Not on anything I just told you, based on how attractive they are. 
By the way, the attractiveness quotient is based on how much they internally resemble a family member. And as my husband was kind enough to point out, a fucked up family member. Dr. Harville Hendricks, the relationship expert, has pointed out that in fact, the more attracted you are to them, the more your core wound is activated. It always amazes me now that people complain they're not really in love with their partners. Scientific research shows in love means the limbic portion of your brain has taken over, which is where the history of the species lives. You have gone, pardon the term, apeshit. That's why I said boring is good, but you have decided in your infinite wisdom that you are not going for boring. You are going for someone who will Stick a spear into every wound you have. The person you are most attracted to is the person most capable of bringing up in you everything that is leaking pus. Some people are more fucked than others. You are looking for someone on a continuum that runs from slightly fucked to very, well, extremely fucked up. Remember, you need to screen carefully. If you remember nothing else I have said this evening, I want you to remember that my husband thought I was very nice and normal. On the upside, you have a chart of exactly what is wrong with them so that you can haul that chart and their ass into therapy, right? No, wrong, you never get to do that. Now that you're in a relationship, you have to take your own inventory. And that's what you're going to do in column B. You're going to say to yourself, how many of these issues do I have? How many times when they said football, did I think bar? How often when they said pain, did I think cocaine? You go right down the column. Column C is for the group you can join. If you're an alcoholic, you can go to AA. If you have emotional problems, you can go to Codependence Anonymous. Coda. For daily intake of pot, I don't know. You can go to Coda and find out where to go for pot. Just to be clear, I am much improved. I used to be a people pleaser. Now, clearly, I please no one. You have to understand eventually how to have boundaries and still be Christ-like, like Mother Teresa, who smoked a lot due to the stress, or so I heard. She and Jesus had boundaries. They did not get married. Now, for those of you who are thinking this is all very negative, I can avoid all of this by just doing the exercises in that film, The Secret. What the hell do you think I was doing in the 1980s? I was meditating with half the people on that film and doing my visualizations and vision boards and such, which is how I came up with that guy on the arm of my red velvet sofa. As they say in the middle of that film, you manifest not only what is conscious, but what is subconscious. And there's the rub. But that's all they say. Let me explain this to you. You are going to do your visualizations before you ever go out with them. Maybe months, maybe years. You're going to do your visualizations 
when you come home. And then you're going to create yourself a nuclear waste sandwich. You are going to take their addictions, their unprocessed, unmetabolized core pain, their ignorance, their karma, and all of yours. And you're going to put it all together. Now, here's the good news. You know how they say God can dream a bigger dream for you than you can dream for yourself? Well, that's true. And you know what God's bigger dream for you may be? To get some big professional help because it's all going to boil up. Relationship makes the worst in you boil up. Every demented, depraved thought or desire you've ever had, every thought you could never imagine you could have of wanting to put your hands around somebody's throat while they're asleep. That is the gift of relationship. Now you're going to become intimately familiar with the fact that everybody has this crust of attractiveness. Right under which you have this bunch of crap. Your addictions and under that your anger. Some people have their anger under their pain. Some people have their pain under their anger. And under that, you have your core wound, your unprocessed, unmitigated, unmetabolized core pains, plural, of course, plus your ignorance, not to mention all of theirs. Underneath that, You've got your essential self. Here it is, your essential self. And eventually, you're going to learn to ride the great waves of life. And you're going to say, it's okay. It's okay. I have my essential self. And besides, you're going to therapy going to every one of these groups every week and here's what it's going to cost you column d is for the money this is one dollar one dollar one dollar one dollar one dollar tm costs more but you can save your tax refund you're going to need some bliss because relationship is not going to give it to you you are also going to need some help for your blood pressure and some means of escape. Let's add some of these expenses. You have $800 for couples therapy. You have eight, but you have a 480 for individual therapy. You have 220 for group therapy. I think you'll enjoy group therapy. You're not gonna wanna cry all the time at your house. It'll be overwhelming for your partner. I think you can do this for a little more than 1,500 a month. Unless you're so codependent that you pick up the tab or your partner. If you're going to visualize, visualize insurance. Additionally, by the way, your sponsors in the Recovering Couples Program are going to tell you to affirm and thank each other. That's perhaps only 20% of the solution for a very challenging partnership, and they're all challenging. Unless you don't live in the same house and seldom see each other, of course, then that becomes the issue. The famous researcher Dr. John Gottman wrote a good book in 2012 about betrayal. The Gottman trained therapist will offer you a two day workshop for about $4,500. They expect you to knock out the stuff from the past in two eight hour days. Are you going to forget about that affair your partner had in the next two days? 
No, you're not. <sighs> Might as well do the affirmations the couple's sponsors gave you. Appreciate the spaghetti he made since you can't get over the affair he had. If you're spending all of this money, you're going to have to eat a lot of spaghetti. Let's be clear. In a way, this very poor choice you have made is your best choice. This person you are deeply attracted to is someone to whom you will want to stick like glue. Someone who will make you miserable. Someone you will want to kill in his or her sleep. Someone you will be afraid will kill you in your sleep. But who will, because of all of the therapy and groups you're going to join, take you to a new level, right through your anger, right down into your pain. Unless you meditate consistently, you may not get a lot of access to your essential self, but now you're acknowledging and feeling your pain. You do want to allow yourself to feel the pain, of course, because otherwise you're just doing spiritual bypass, which ain't going to work. I tried for decades. Now that you're in touch with the pain of your childhood, you can share it. And you're helping the damned species evolve. Sure, you can't see much progress. And neither can anyone else. Just remember, it took the species a long time to tear up the planet. It's going to take a hell of a long time for us to evolve our way out of this ditch. If you are clear that what you want is love and comfort, get a dog. A marriage is not for comfort. You are moving toward what some say will be your eventual enlightenment. The quest for enlightenment through self-improvement is the new opiate of the marriage, opiate of the masses. Now you see, because you are going to have to develop compassion for this one miserable, horrible human being you have chosen. You will develop compassion for the entire fucked up human race. Here you are with this idiot who truly is incapable of loving anyone. And suddenly you can see what this idiot has been through. You want to overcome all of your selfishness for them. Life tricks you into becoming someone you never intended, a much more loving human being. And if you can do this for someone in your house who drives you stark raving mad, you can do it for the entire Middle East. Eventually, you will become Christ-like, like Buddha, all because you have married this one insufferable human being who seldom does anything right. By the way, I think there is a distinct possibility that we are not graduating to a planet where there is far less suffering unless we all graduate together. And what if we are not graduating to a better planet until everyone on the planet not only has food and clothing, but has been through therapy, which seems to be an essential part of the divine design. Making a marriage work is about as difficult as getting the walruses and the polar bears to lie down with the baby seals. Maybe if we all get along, they will. I had one New Age teacher in the 1970s who said so. Did I pay for the lecture where they told me that was going to happen? Yes, I did. If marriage doesn't make you more loving, it certainly teaches you humility. It beats the hubris right out of you. Alternatively, learn to appreciate and affirm your new divorce attorney. 
After a certain number of betrayals, all of this endless talk about forgiveness is just making you stuff your feelings and making you fatter. You can forgive without staying in the marriage or staying for the spaghetti. And I just want to point out, this is kind of like a flower, isn't it? Just like nature on the planet Earth to make beauty out of all of this suffering. From a distance, this all looks really attractive to you. Like a moth to the flame. Now I know you want to hear from the experts, so here is something from someone who married someone 18 years younger than he was and a good deal more attractive. This is a quote from H.L. Mencken. Love is the triumph of imagination over intelligence. And the following quote from Mencken is courtesy of our very widely respected couples therapist. How does it go? In life, basically, you have two choices. You can stay single and be miserable or marry and wish you were dead. <laughs> Bravo. Way to go, Lambeth. Thank you all very much for being here. Thanks to the performers and good night. Good night.